All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for all being here tonight. Uh, my name is Tim Smith, and I am the current president of the Boston Society for Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry. And this is our last meeting of uh, the year. And uh, we'll be starting this up again, uh, I believe, in September. So thank you so much for coming. Um, tonight's meeting, so as you, many of you have heard many, many times, this society was founded in 1880, which is just a couple of years ago. And tonight is the 1,042nd meeting. So it's uh, such a privilege to be involved with this auspicious group. And I apologize tonight that we're in a little bit of a different location. Uh, it's graduation season, so many of the other uh, rooms are being used tonight. Um, there's not much in the way of announcements. I will tell you that if you have an idea that you think would be a great topic for one of next year's lectures, please talk to me at any time. You can email me, and we'd be happy to discuss it. We'll, we'll be meeting, I believe, in uh, July or August to discuss the next uh, round of topics. Um, I want to introduce our first speaker tonight. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing him now for about two years. Um, Amar Don is an, a neurologist and network scientist. He, he received his MD from Harvard and his Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. His graduate work with uh, Professor Jeffrey Walford focused on peer learning among heroin users in New Delhi. He completed a medical internship, neurology residency, and a fellowship at UCSF. And he's currently assistant professor of neurology at HMS with a joint appointment at the Network Science Institute at Northeastern. I've had the privilege of working with Amar now for the last year uh, on a joint project. And tonight, he's going to be the first of a two-part series surrounding natural and artificial intelligence. Right. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and uh, particularly thank you for this provocative title and uh, topic for tonight's uh, session. Um, I'm going to be speaking about natural intelligence, which I think has been underutilized and underappreciated in the neurosciences. And uh, what I'm going to do is show a depiction of how we uh, model this, how we, how we measure it, and then how we utilize it to improve patient outcomes. So, at this end here. so um, we're in a connected age. Uh, this is the Facebook network from 2010. And uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, I would argue, however, that this isn't a new phenomenon. We've always been social animals. And uh, we've always been uh, signifying our dislike and likes for each other through the connections that we have with other people. Uh, this, is, this has largely been ignored in medicine, unfortunately, because we focus so much on the patient and the biology of that patient that we don't really think about the external factors um, as much. Uh, public health has, has tried to do a better job through to looking at the exposome and environmental factors. Uh, but the very immediate factor that affects a patient's health is perhaps their very immediate social network, the habits of that network, the number of people in that network, how those people's health problems are proceeding. All of these are fundamental importance to the way that the patient survives and how well they'll do after an illness develops. Um, a quote that uh, Dr. Um, Alvaro Pascual-Leon actually shared with me recently, we're working together on an NFL project, is that tell me who you walk with and I'll tell you who you are. And I think that's very apropos to the importance of a social network. This, for example, is uh, a network that I created, scraped off of the internet. All of you could do it yourself. If you have a Facebook account, uh, there are tools that allow you to, to to scrape off all the, all the individuals, their contacts, and who they're connected to. And, um, and what we did is we just ran a simple algorithm that asked, what are the groups in this, in this network if you don't know anything else about who they are, just who they're connected with? 
and very quickly it actually figures out that there are clusters in your network and if you look at the clusters you get a pretty good idea of who I am and where I've come from um, ever, ever since Saskatoon is where I'm from in Canada uh, so sort of my biography Dartmouth is where I went to undergrad Oxford for grad school Harvard for med school UCSF for uh, residency Brigham Boston is my current location family and then I spent a lot of time in India doing my research and now I'm in the Network Science Institute. I mean this is basically a biography of who I am and it's it's all elicited through just an understanding of my connections. So this has developed into a new movement actually forwarded by the Brigham if you read a lot of Lascalzo's work recently. It's called Network Medicine. It states that we focus too much on individual units and that's actually failed us um, in drug development, in understanding cardiovascular disease, and in understanding the full social picture of a patient. And what it's done is uh, we're left with a bunch of pieces that we now have to put together. Uh, and he's been attempting to do that along with uh, one of my mentors, Los, um, um, Laszlo Barabasi, who wrote this editorial back in 2007, to create a multi-level network model. And that network has multiple layers, one of which is the mo molecules, the second is diseases, and the third would be the social. We think especially for cardiovascular, stroke, um, but also for dementia, for um, brain tumor disease, uh, patients, we think that the social network is fundamental in order to adapt lifestyle. So anytime you're giving a lifestyle speech, Right? You're, you're in the clinic and you're trying to get someone to change their behavior. I think it's insufficient to just simply give a speech to that one person. I think that to really understand the milieu and to then have that milieu help you in, in changing habits, you have to understand the social network. So we think it's fundamental importance to the health preparedness of the patient. I'll explain what that is. Risk factor management, medication adherence, and functional recovery. And I'll give you a very concrete example as to how this makes a difference. This is our model. Uh, we, we created a patient-centered social network approach. Um, it's, it's actually adapted from very well-studied social network uh, methods in sociology. Uh, we called it the social connectome. Um, it uses the exact same mathematical basis graph theory as we use for brain um, scan uh, functional MRI research. So by mapping the patient's ties, whether they're strong or weak with the people around them, and also looking at the person, the, those person's ties with each other, you can, you can grab a whole number of statistics that uh, can be um, used for understanding the patient's social networks, things like size, density, the percent of family members, the percent of smoking in the, uh, social, in the social network. I'll show you how this is done, just so you can dream about what, how this might be applied to your clinic. Um, first of all, we've practiced and we're, we're exploring multiple ways of measuring these social networks. So um, we started with uh, very traditional uh, clipboard-based paper surveys. We're now using a red cap based web survey. Uh, we've started to use phones and we're starting to even use body cameras. And I'll, te I'll, I'll show you how we're doing each of these um, going forward here. This was our first method. Um, again, very much adapted from hard sociology literature on this. Uh, it was basically a table that we would fill out um, we would ask patients, I'll, I'll go through the exact questions we asked them, but basically we put their names in this half matrix um, and then we fill out who's connected to who um, by asking the patient to go through and, and iterate on each of the people that they mentioned. This is the basic point, the, the structure of the survey. It takes 15 to 20 minutes max per patient. Um, you ask, who do you discuss personal matters with on a regular basis? Who do you socialize with on a regular basis? And we give examples. And then who do you turn to for support or information if you needed help? Okay. These are the three circles that we felt were critically important to understand 
um, and to help the patient through a health crisis. Um, we then ask, what are the connections between these people? So how are you connected to Mary? How are you connected to Fred? Um, are you strongly connected or weakly connected? We give definitions, very easy to understand. And then how is Mary connected to Fred? Okay. So that is how the network ties are, are determined. And then finally, what are the characteristics of Mary? What are the characteristics of Fred? And we ask a number of questions like their demographics, their health problems, whether they eat healthy, whether they exercise. You can have a, a very nice density of information collected very quickly using this method. So that's the structure. And this is one of the beautiful things about our method is it, it creates these very understandable but not obvious maps of your social network. So this is a patient in our study. He was a stroke patient. We measured the network at hospitalization, and then we measured it three and six months. Um, and we can now have, we have a pipeline in which we take in the data and we can provide them with the graph almost immediately. Um, and as well as a table of their results. And, um, and so the, in this diagram, we explain that the red ties are strong ties, the blue ties are weak ties. And, um, and you see, uh, but the patient didn't see it in initially, was that there's a cluster here, right? There's this group of people on the right, on the right side, and then these scattered people on the left. And um, if the patient doesn't do something to try to keep this network together, these people on the left actually dissipate. They disappear as the patient goes through the stroke recovery process and the, pa and the, and the networks shrink. That's the usual pattern that we've seen is that especially weak ties tend to go away. They disappear. And so here's another example um, of a patient who had only two people in their network. Um, and they're both strongly connected to the patient, but only weakly connected to each other. Um, this patient did not do well after stroke. Their physical function was declined. Even though they had a mild stroke, um, they had a lot of problem with engaging in rehab. They didn't have the support necessary. Um, they had a, a problem with their social system that didn't enable them to have the optimal recovery. And we found that this social network size is as important as age and stroke severity in determining their physical function at six months. Here's another example of a patient. You can see every patient has a different system around them. Uh, and, and learning about that system is revealing for the doctor, the patient, and then building strategies around how to activate or how to use that system optimally is very personalized. This, I think, is the new generation of personalized medicine using social networks. Mike is very important in this system, right? The closer you are to uh, the patient, the, that means that you're tied to a lot of the people. So this person is the linchpin um, to keep that network together and then must be involved. And it's not the person's husband, it turns out. It's a friend, and that friend is who should be at rehab sessions. That friend should be coming to clinic appointments. That friend, I mean, that is the person we need to locate. It's not the wife who's, um, who's somewhere else, right? So it's a very um, interesting dealing. Okay, and so now why it's all fancy. Uh, we can make it mathematical. But why, why is this important? Okay, so here's one of the biggest problems in our field, okay? Stroke neurology has a very big problem in that 75% of people arrive after three hours after stroke symptoms. They arrive late. So all of the remarkable discoveries and interventions that we've done um, are moot because they can't be delivered to the patients who don't arrive. So only 9% of patients actually get IV TPA, which is our, which has been our gold standard for acute stroke treatment for 15 years. Only 9%. There's now been extended windows um, for IA treatment uh, that just have been um, proven to be effective in the last year um, or so. But those are not 
Um, they also have the problem of there's 9 million cells that are dying every minute uh, when you're having a stroke. And so even if you do recanalize, there's still a decrement compared to if they came earlier. So it's a hu huge problem. But what has been ignored, and, and, and the focus has been, what are the characteristics of the patients that, that, that make them late? And, and, and all the epidemiologists have been focusing on the individual and their race and their class and their social economic status and their, um, their depression and their, and their prior comorbidities, all of which are important, but they ignored the fact that most strokes occur in front of people. Okay, 80, 70 percent of strokes occur at home, 80 percent occur in front of people. And it's that discussion and that deliberation that occurs between two or more people, that is the determining factor of whether someone comes to the hospital on time or doesn't. It's not the patient by himself um, or herself. It's this sort of network that's acting on the patient's behalf. And we've, we haven't paid attention to that enough. And so we did a little study in which we looked at the social networks of patients as they come to the hospital and saw whether or not they came in early or late. Early meaning before six hours, late meaning after six hours. So I'll open up to the crowd right now. Of these two patients, which one's gonna come on time? The patient on the left is a patient who's married. Um, actually, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a wife, but he, has, um, he lives with his mother and two sisters, um, very tight-knit. They're witnessing the stroke. They're very supportive. They're very loving. Um, they want uh, to help the patient as much as possible, and they're available to give a report. Okay, so that's the patient on the left. The patient on the right is also a widow. She has a, a, friends, a group of friends from church who don't see her very often. They see each other once a week, and a group of other uh, a, a daughter and coworkers, neighbors, coworker who see them intermittently, but she lives by herself. Uh, both of them have a mild stroke. Uh, which patient's gonna come in early? A or B? Everyone for A, put up your hand. Anyone for B? Tim Smith, <laughs> all right. So, um, let me give you the story. So the patients who came in early had larger networks with more holes in the network. What I mean by holes is the, the, this, the lack of tie between people. So the lack of ties between people is a good thing, it turns out, whereas tightly knit, close knit structures are bad for you when it comes to stroke arrival. That was counterintuitive, right? We thought that the more support they have, the more the, the structure will help them to the hospital, and it turns out it's the opposite. It's the less, less it's the weak ties. It's called the strength of weak ties, okay? No, please, yeah. 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 So, so we have a the yeah. So, so we did interviewed them afterwards to ask that question, and this it was a great comment. Um, this is the the basic uh, descriptive statistics. The people who came in early had a network size of eight. People who came in late had network size of five, and uh, the constraint, which is the amount of close knit nature of the network, how strongly close knit they are was much higher in the slow arrivers versus the fast arrivers. And why did this happen? Well, first of all, the slow arrivers tended to contact a strongly tied person. So one of those red lines. They're either in presence of that red line or they contacted a red line person. A fast arriver was more likely to contact a weak tie. 60% of time, they were more likely to be in the presence of or contact a friend or a coworker or a non-relative compared to the slow arriver. 
And then what happens in the communication is actually displayed in these pictures. The slow arrivers tend to, A, selectively disclose the symptoms. They don't tell their symptoms right away to their loved one. Number two, they over-negotiate, sometimes bicker about the symptoms and what to do. And number three, they confirm each other's opinion that a watch and wait strategy is the best idea here, perhaps because they're in a caring environment and they can be watched there without problem. The fast arrivers did not negotiate. They actually disrupted opinions to watch and they provided novel information like this may be a stroke, you need to go and get some help right now. And they didn't, sometimes didn't even include the patient in the decision, they just called 911. Here's the, here's the story of that. So these are the three things that happened in the slow arrivers we found. Um, and here's the historic, I had, this is a society here that was been born in the 19th century, so I have to give a 19th century quote. Um, Gowers, one of our founders of neurology, stated there's a, he actually noticed that the people can be blinded by affection. And I love that term, blinded by affection, right? And you see it all the time, you know, people just don't recognize the fact a patient's deteriorating or they don't recognize a new symptom that's occurring and it's perhaps because they're just um, too close to the patient. Um, and this was the, uh, you know, quote of what happens in the other direction. Something is wrong with you, you need to go to the doctor. Okay. So here's um, a video that just depicts both of these in the same patient. I found one patient in whom she was both early and late. And uh, she had two strokes actually. Um, and this was her video. Uh, in October, I was coming home with a friend of mine. We've been out for the day shopping, and uh, all of a sudden, I just could tell that I wasn't talking right. I, I was talking to her, but I, the words were coming out either slurred or off. I just knew they weren't right, but I thought it was funny she didn't say anything. But then when I brought it up to her, she said, yes, you're talking funny and I'm pulling over soon. We're going to call an ambulance. And she did call an ambulance. And I ended up, even though I didn't want to go to the hospital and kind of fought it, I ended up going to the hospital and staying there um, overnight. Got it. And what was the delay time between when you recognize something, when she's when you mentioned it to your friend about, um, you know, by the time I was talking, I it could have been five ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. And then the second episode you had over Christmas, can you tell me about that, please? Yeah, we were just uh, been out all day Christmas at my niece's house, and we were just gonna play a game. So I went to sit at the dining room table, and I. All of a sudden, it was like all the people were talking around me, like like I was underwater, like she said. Um, that, and um, I wasn't focusing, they said, at all. And they'd asked me a question, and it was, had a delay in me answering the questions for them. And unfortunately, I just laid down and went to sleep, which probably didn't, so I don't know how long it lasted. They said, do you want to lay down? And I said, yeah, I think I better, and I lay down, and I went to sleep, and later on I drove home, and I never went to the doctor until she pushed me to go call my primary care to email them. And she being? And being Ooh. my daughter. Yeah. Right, so that's, I'm sure you guys can relate to some of these stories, but that's an example of both the weak tie activating and then the strong ties deactivating action. Okay, so our next step has been to actually scale this. So we had the paper and pen version and now we put it onto a web survey and this web survey can be remotely sent to any patient in the world um, and we have a pipeline in which we can now uh, map the networks and diagnose them and provide feedback to patients. So we've now executed an experiment in which we actually have 1,488 um, social network, patients who had their social networks mapped. This was part of a, 
a GEMS study, which was a Phil DeJager study now at Columbia. Um, these are people, relatives of people, of patients with MS, and so he's, he's mapping out risk factors for MS, and we think that the social environment will have a contribution in that disease. And I just want you to, to, to pay attention to this next uh, map. This is all of their social networks on one page. Um, and what you can notice is just the beautiful diversity of, of networks. And, you know, one of the things we're always asked is, are, are you sure you're collecting accurate data? Uh, you know, we try very hard with our questions. We interview patients afterwards. We verify. We use different techniques. Uh, but just the, the fact that people answer so many diverse ways uh, reassures us that we're getting a novel and, um, and probably uh, unique and uh, valid point of view of their, of their networks. We're also using phones um, with uh, Dr. Smith as well as uh, Dr. Onella. Um, we're starting to track the digital phenotype of these patients along with their social networks and seeing how those inter interrelate. Um, I mapped out my own. Uh, you can also map out your own network very easily just by scraping your phone log. And, um, and this is my uh, network over 671 days of unique individuals, um, along with the duration of how long I talk to them and how often I talk to them. So I think this is a, a, a gold mine of data as well. Lastly is a very interesting story, which is the bo uh, body cameras. So these have come into commercial use, uh, GoPro, but there's even smaller ones like the narrative clip, the tie on to your tie. And you literally walk through uh, wherever you're going, and it takes a picture every 30 seconds. So we wanted to know whether it could capture social interactions. Could we give one to a patient and actually track how many faces did they actually engage with in a 24-hour period, maybe even in a week? Because the social network is built up by social interactions. And if we could diagnose whether a person is socially isolated or socially enriched, that would help us help them to, um, to improve their social life and improve their outcomes. And so we tested both in stroke patients. We found one to be better. Um, and now we're working with a Duke group because as you can imagine, there's a privacy concern here if you're taking pictures of people. Um, so we're working with a, a, a computer scientist at Duke who's actually going to um, build a camera that never stores pictures but only says a counter of how many people they're interacting with. And so I could tell you at the end of the day, you had 27 interactions. And he could even figure out which ones are unique and not unique. So he can do facial comparison. Because the facial recognition is so advanced now that, that we, can, we can use that technology to figure out how many unique interactions you've had in a given day. Um, I think this is also a future thing that um, along with the the digital phenotype, we can actually get actual social interaction rates. So that's my summary of the measurement tools that we're using to measure social networks. Here's just a, a slide on the challenges. Um, privacy, we've mentioned, right? So especially with the cameras, maybe the phones, um, people are, are very reluctant to, to let go of their social information. Um, and we're working very hard to try to build stage-wise checkpoints and examine how patients are doing with them and explain to them what we're doing. But um, this is going to be something that we constantly have to worry about and have to think about. Number two, um, the validity of the network construction. How, how accurate is this? How valid is it? Um, something that we're using multiple measures for and continually trying to improve. And then lastly, the um, can you actually do something with this information? Okay, So if, if I've shown you that we can measure them, if I've shown you that they're important, if you agree with that to some degree, can you actually change them? Because then that would be a modifiable risk factor, right? We don't have very many modifiable risk factors in, uh, in neurology left. And um, could this be one of those gold mines that we could harness to improve disease outcomes? And we're trying to do that now. So we just submitted a grant and we're starting up enrollment at a network intervention. So we map the patient's network, and instead of saying caregiver one, which is usually the wife or husband, you always have to bring this patient to clinic appointments. You always have to come to rehab sessions. You always have to be the designated driver. No, 
we're going to ask the network to participate in the care. We're going to rotate the network person who's going to bring them to the rehab session, especially the rehab session. <coughs> Patients will give us feedback. They don't want a, straight, like a neighbor to come to a doctor's appointment. That's too personal. But they will invite the neighbor to a rehab session because it's just an exercise class. Right? And so we want to rotate the responsibilities and distribute the responsibilities across this network, activate it, engage it, make it so that it doesn't disappear, and perhaps create new ties that the patient never had before the disease. That's idea number one. Idea number two is how do you change habits? <laughs> you know, we struggled with this so much. How do you change smoking habits? How do you change eating habits? How do you change exercise habits? I think the secret is not to convince one person or even pharmacologically change the habits of one person. I think you got to change the immediate social network's habits together. They're all, they're, there's data that shows that no one smokes in a, in a social network without any smokers. There usually is at least one other smoker. There has to be a way to bring that other person in and say, this has been a life-changing event. If you want your mother to continue to live, stop smoking, and we're going to do this together, and we're going to check you. Right? And we should do that for blood pressure. We should do that for um, eating habits. We should do that for exercise. I think this is the, the future. We have to collect this natural intelligence to enforce, um, to deploy and enforce the patient's behavior. All right. So I think in the future, uh, if aliens do come and visit us, they're going to ask, where is your social network? because I think that's going to be the critical information for the future. Um, I'm just going to finish with some art. Uh, one of my patients is an artist, and she actually took my data and placed it into um, these crochage uh, diagrams. And so this is a patient in the middle, and the pink dots are the number of people that the patient had in her network at time zero, time three months, and time six months. It's like a tree ring diagram. And she made a full collage of these, and now it's being displayed at various hospitals in the Midwest. Thank you for your time. Yes? So you showed the counterintuitive result of people with um, close-knit network uh, were actually slow to come in. Uh, that was in the U.S. Is that, yeah. is that valid for other cultures? It hasn't been studied in other cultures. I think it's a great question. Don't know the answer. <laughs> I think weak ties are critical. I think even in other cultures, it's going to be significant because that in that in that moment of a stroke emergency, um, the information that you get is the most important element to the decision to go or not to go. Whether you have a person who actually knows what a stroke is, and that typically comes from people who are not close to you, but comes from an outside source. Um, unless you happen to be in a medical family or happen to be in a very intelligent local network, typically it's the novel information, disruptive information comes from the weak ties. And I don't think that's just a Western phenomenon. Local. Yeah. I think I've heard of it, but I'll check it out. Thank you. Yeah, there's also confounding of personality, depression. 
we measure as many as we can um, of the known confounders in the social network literature. So employment, depression, personality, um, we have all that data and this is independent of those. Um, but there's still, you know, there's still, this is not genetics, so it's an acquired um, trait, if you will, and so there's still p potential, definite interactions with all the things you mentioned, um, but I still, I, I still think even if it is a proxy for a combination of things, it's a useful proxy, right, because I can measure it in 15 to 20 minutes, whereas all those other, and I can modify, I can do something with it, and I can show patients what they're do what's happening with it. Whereas all those other things, um, I think are, it's difficult to actually parse down. This is a parsed down model of your social world. Yeah. So the question I guess is have you have you factored in the difference between patients who get to the hospital with strokes and patients who actually have strokes in terms of their network? Because I feel like it could be that patients with uh, weaker networks would be less likely to make it to the hospital and be registered with stroke patients unless they are one of those non negotiators and the mm. So um, in your comments, you mean specifically the patient who may be having a stroke alone, who, who's abandoned. Um, so yes, I think it's both. I think that there are people, if you're alone, when you have a severe stroke and you're incapacitated, then it's a risk factor. <laughs> um, you, you will not arrive because you cannot, and we have patients um, both clinically experienced and in our study who've had that happen. Um, just they can reach the phone. Um, to call 91, or they couldn't talk. You know, it's a very unfortunate scenario. But I would say that's the minority of cases. Um, and in our study, we particularly focused on the highest risk. So it turns out that severe strokes, they tend to come just because of the severity of the symptoms. And so we focused on the mild stroke. And those are the ones that are the highest risk for not coming because they over-negotiate and do all these things. Um, and in that group, this is the finding. That if you have a large network with weak ties and openness in your network, you tend to come in faster because there's more disruption of the, of the status quo. Whereas if you have those small, close-knit, there's an echo chamber. And they just reinforce each other's opinion to watch. Should we, Tim, should we be taking questions or? One more question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Which means it doesn't mean that patients who have different group of friends or network which are connected to each other is protecting each other. Who are not connected to each other? Yes. That's protective. If you have these, kind of like my Facebook network, if you have these clusters of people who are totally divided, I am then getting information from all these different segments of the world, they're my sensors, basically. Mm. Um, well, here's the number. Uh, the a human being's average social network is 150 people. Um, so you want to be close to that, <laughs> um, at least, if not higher. Um, but but that's that's the. That's how much our brain capacity can hold, actually, um, is 150. It's the highest of any mammal species. And they go down based on the proportion of the brain. So um, it's a beautiful story, an evolutionary story of how our capacity to have a social contact network is based on our brain volume. All right. Thank you, everyone. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. So just based on that, it sounds like the average neurosurgeon probably has a social network of about 20. And the neurologist, what, 500 or something?
Um, the next speaker is um, a friend of mine named Omar Arno. Um, he, I've known Omar for, for many years. He uh, went to medical school at Northwestern Chicago and then um, completed a residency there in neurosurgery where I had the dubious responsibility of being part of a training network for him. He was a few years behind in training. And I will tell you that uh, of all of the residents that I came into contact with while in that system, Omar, far and away, was the most gifted. And he, uh, after completing that, uh, performed two clinical fe fellowships, one here with uh, Dr. Almefti in skull-based surgery, and then one abroad with Dr. Teo in an endoscopic approach to the skull base. And then we had the good fortune of attracting him back, and he's now part of the faculty here, uh, and he's been just an amazing colleague. He is now also one of the co-directors of the Computational Neuroscience Outcomes Center, where his focus has really been on machine learning and artificial intelligence as it applies to the neurosurgical patients. So please welcome Omar. Thank you, Timothy. I, I paid him a lot of money for that very kind introduction, so I'm glad to see that it went to good use. Um, Amar, that was a, a really great presentation, and it's a tough act to follow. Um, I'll do my best. And I have to apologize, because I see some of our lab members here, and they've heard some version of this talk before, so I'm, I'm sorry if some of this is repetition, but there's going to be a pop quiz at the end, so you still have to pay attention. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the artificial intelligence part of what we do. Um, like Tim said, I, I get the uh, good fortune of being able to do some of this work as part of our group in CNOC. And Partners just happens to be a great place to do it for several reasons that I'll get into. So uh, first of all, I have no disclosures, I'm happy to say, relevant to this or anything else, really. So I, I break this talk into two parts. Uh, one is kind of an overview about artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and what those words actually mean. Um, as you probably know, it's, it's a very popular topic, and it's in the lay press, um, I feel like, pretty often for different reasons. It's got applications, obviously, uh, that go beyond, beyond medicine. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about those concepts and differentiating them. And then, of course, I'll tell you about the work that we do and how we take these concepts and apply them to, uh, in my case, mostly neurosurgical oncology, which is, which is my clinical passion. Okay, so three key terms that are related, that are often used interchangeably, but really mean different things. Artificial intelligence uh, is a very broad concept, and it really started probably sometime in the 1950s. Um, and for a long time, for decades, it used to be this thing that we now call expert systems, which uh, worked really well for well-defined problems. So let me tell you a little bit about what it is. So. An expert system is when you take a problem that you can break down into separate steps. If this, then do this, and if this, then do that. And for those problems, you can, you can build those rules together. You can have explicit rules that you put together, and you can solve problems. And for decades, that was the state of the art in artificial intelligence. So for problems like playing chess, it's a well-defined problem with a well-defined set of rules, and those systems were very good at solving those problems. And uh, as a human race, uh, we, we invested a lot of effort and money into this. So at some point in the late 80s, billions of dollars were being poured into this. And it turns out, for most problems, there isn't really a clear set of rules. They're more what we call fuzzy problems. And these things were terrible at, at solving those problems. So um, this was the, the beginning of the first AI winter when people lost interest in AI and, and said, this is really not useful, it's been overhyped. And, uh, and it kind of fell out of favor. In the 1990s, this concept of machine learning became a little bit popular, which, as you can see in this Venn diagram, is really a subset. It's a, it's a subtype of artificial intelligence. And uh, within that is deep learning, which is now the hot topic. Most of our research is deep learning. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about machine learning first, and then from there we'll go into deep learning. OK, so classical computer programming, classical artificial intelligence, uh, is where you take a set of rules, a set of data, you explicitly program those, and you get your answers that you want out of it. So machine learning that started around the 1990s uh, kind of turned the whole paradigm on its head. And so now we take a set of data, 
and a set of answers that we expect from that data or we know are true and we put them into this algorithm and we ask it to generate the rules uh, and that was, a, that was a paradigm shift. Okay, so to program a machine learning algorithm you really just need three things. Uh, you need a bunch of data, obviously. Uh, you have to have some output, so you have to have some labels for those data, you know, the thing that you're trying to make it uh, uh, decide on. And you have to have some measure. You have to have some way of uh, quantifying how good or bad your algorithm is at getting you to this, to this endpoint. And uh, this, I should say, is a, is a subtype even of machine learning. This is what we call supervised machine learning, where you have labels. There are other kinds that are a little bit more advanced. But this is by and far the most common type of machine learning that anybody does. OK, let me give you a concrete example of what that means, what those three things could look like. So here's a very simple problem. This is a, a set of points uh, that belong on a Cartesian scale, you know, an x-axis and a y-axis. And there's two kinds of dots. There's a black dot and a white dot. And the problem that you're trying to solve here is if I give you a new dot, if I give you an, an x and a y coordinate, can you tell me if it belongs to the black group or the white group? And this is how a machine learning algorithm would solve this problem. It would take the raw data, the first component. Um, it would apply a transformation. And it would just basically have a list of transformations that it will go through. In this case, you can imagine just by changing where the x and y axis live, you can, you can essentially solve this problem completely. And uh, this will be one solution. So in this new transformation, on this new x and y axis, uh, if the x is greater than 0, then it's black. If the x is less than 0, it's white. So, so a machine learner would go through a bunch of transformations. It would, at each step, it would ass assess its accuracy. How good am I at, at solving this problem if, it, if the answer is not good, it would try a different one, and so on, until it finds one that's good. So this, at its core, is what machine learning is. OK, so to, just to build on that, uh, deep learning, which is a variant, a subtype of machine learning, which is very, very popular. Everybody talks about it. We're trying to apply it to all kinds of problems, uh, is not too dissimilar from classical machine learning. So if machine learning is all about transformations and finding a good one, uh, deep learning is all about adding different layers of transformations. And that's, in order to de demystify it, that's, that's all it is. So you take these transformations and you layer them up, and, and for reasons that I'll get into, that basically helps you come up with better predictions than if you just had one transformation. It makes intuitive sense, I think. So this is, a, this is an, uh, an example from a very classic machine learning problem, which is, um, taking handwritten digits and trying to figure out, you know, which number they actually are. Uh, and this is how a deep learning network would figure this out. It would take this handwritten digit, it would apply these transformations that, to us, look like they're nonsensical. But if you spend a couple of minutes looking at them, you get the sense that at every additional layer, you're getting a little bit more granular information. Uh, but by applying these transformations, it eventually turns out is really good at figuring out what the handwritten number really is. OK, so if we take this a step further, uh, I'm going to walk you through how to build a deep learning model from scratch. And again, my purpose of doing this is, is to hopefully take the mystery out of it, because it's, you hear about it every day, and it sounds magical. And if I'm successful, I'll prove to you that it's not magical. It makes perfect sense, and it's not as complicated as some might make it seem. OK. So we have a problem, and um, in this case, let's say it's classifying pictures of cats and dogs. So as your input, the input x is, is literally a photograph of either a cat or a dog. And like we talked about, because we're doing deep learning, we're going to apply a couple of transformations. In this case, literally a couple, two transformations. And we're going to come up with a prediction y, which is in this case is going to be cat or dog. OK, so we're going to build this together. So uh, in order to figure out which transformation you're going to apply, uh, you're going to assign weights to them. And uh, your goal from doing this whole thing is to find the right weights. And just think of each weight as a different transformation. So you're just trying to find the right transformation. And in order to do this, you're going to put, put your pictures through this algorithm, have a couple of transformations, and come up with some prediction. 
And since you don't know what the weights are going to be, you'll just start with random weights, random transformations, and just see what happens. And um, at some point, you have sat down as a human being, and you've labeled them. You've labeled at least a portion of these with what they actually are, with true labels of cats and dogs. Now, if you compare these true labels with these essentially random predictions, uh, and if you compare those two things, you can come up with a measure of error, how different or how, how close are these predictions to the true targets. And you can quantify that. You can create a score uh, based on those differences or similarities. And then one of the biggest advancements in um, deep learning is some of these optimization algorithms that we came up with. And I won't get into the, the algebra behind this, but it's, it's a concept called gradient descent, which, which basically ensures that every time you modify these weights, you're actually headed closer and closer towards the truth. That every iteration, every modification isn't random. At that point, it's, it's targeted and it's getting you closer to where you want to be, which where you want to be is minimizing this, this loss score, the error score. Okay, so that's, that is all there is to it. That's what deep learning is. And this relatively simple concept has really enabled us to do some really amazing things that seem magical because they're so good. Um, image classification as a problem uh, has essentially been solved. For, for most things, the computer can classify images just as well as human beings can do. And the same is true with, with uh, speech recognition. Uh, transcription, the ability to change speech into written language has also been essentially solved by this algorithm. And a lot of the hype that you hear and read about, about it, you know, cars driving themselves, autonomous driving, those systems are entirely built on this, this concept. The, the computer's ability to recognize uh, cats and dogs and trees and other cars and people running across the street and then reacting, reacting to those things. And uh, medicine is no different. We've, we've made some uh, interesting strides in medicine as a result of this. So if you take the, the thing that we just built together and replace cats and dogs with pictures of retinas, in this case, this is diabetic retinopathy, and um, the ophthalmologists can classify the extent of your diabetic retinopathy using very explicit features, you know, things like microhemorrhages and aneurysms and cholesterol plaques yeah. and, and all those things. But if you take those pictures that have been classified by professional expert ophthalmologists and you label them healthy or, or diseased, healthy or diabetic, and you feed them into that exact same algorithm that we just built, uh, and you compare that algorithm's performance on data it's never seen before versus the professional ophthalmologists, you get these results. So these are uh, this is from a, a now a pretty famous paper in JAMA about this topic that was written by uh, researchers at Google. And this is an AUC curve, an area under the, under the curve, uh, that compares um, in the colored dots the human experts' performance, and the line that you see there, the black line, is the computer. And the point is, even when you zoom in on it, the performance of the computer is as good essentially, as these expert um, clinicians. The difference, of course, is that expert clinician who took years and years to get to that stage, at some point is going to retire, and a new one's going to come, and that person will take years and years to get to that stage. And those experts aren't everywhere. So in this particular disease process, Google has put this onto <coughs> portable devices that you can take to third world countries where those experts don't exist. And you can literally take a picture of somebody's uh, retina and you can tell them with as much precision as a Brigham ophthalmologist can that they have retinopathy or not. So there's some real high impact, uh, real world implications to these algorithms. All right, so I've talked a lot about deep learning, but I want to just highlight for one second the importance of uh, the other kind of machine learning. Uh, I don't want to imply that we've moved beyond it. Um, so classical machine learning remains an incredibly powerful tool to generate predictions. So yeah, of course. I'm yeah, I wasn't sure if you were stretching. I'm stretching and asking yeah. questions. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've tried to wrap my mind around with regards to deep learning is all of these algorithms, all of these models are based on a classification related to national intelligence. 
So someone has given this algorithm a training set and explained to the machine that this is diseased but that this is not. So it's hard for me to understand how this algorithm could perform better if the standard is human definition. Yeah, so when I say things like better, like those ophthalmologists, for example, we're not all created equal anyway. So even the ophthalmologists fall into a curve. And if you, if you, it's not going to perform better than the best one, but you could argue that it's going to perform, and in that curve, it does perform, uh, it performs better than the average. Uh, you can say better than the average, but you're right. If the gold, it's not going to be better than the gold standard. If your gold standard is defined as the human, it's not going to be better than the human, or, or that best human. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the follow-up, the follow-up, the answer to your question and the follow-up to to uh, Tim's question is that I'm focusing on supervised machine learning because it's the most common one. It's the easiest one to understand. Um, but it's really it's there's three big kinds of, of deep learning. The the other one is unsupervised machine learning. So, the the slide that Amar showed where he mapped his own network. Uh, where it showed Dartmouth and you know where he works now, so uh, I'm 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 willing to bet that, that was generated by an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, which which basically looks at unlabeled data and tries to predict can I find clusters where these things are related to each other. So there is a, a whole separate kind of machine learning which I intentionally left out of this that can generate those labels. Yeah. What's the situation in which two computers yeah. So, yeah, I do, I do. So this is clearly an advanced group, and I should have tailored this talk <laughs> to more an advanced group. So, so there's, um, there's a yet different kind of, of deep learning. It, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, these, they're called GANs, and those are very kind of cutting edge. Uh, and I, I wish I, if I knew you were going to ask that, I would have brought some cool slides about that. But no, no, it's a very good question. So GANs are generative, generative uh, adversarial networks. So you basically have two algorithms, one that is labeling things and the other one that's generating data. Uh, and they're basically competing with each other. And one is trying to trick the other. And as the, as the one that's labeling gets better, the other one gets better at producing fake data. So, uh, so they both become good. They both become really good. And that, those have been used to do some really cool stuff. For example, um, you can take a picture on your phone and you can feed it to an algorithm that'll make it look like a, a Picasso painting. And it's because it's learned to generate that style, having learned from his actual paintings. Uh, we use it for different reasons. So we've used it before to generate brain tumor MRIs. So we can generate an MRI of a fake patient, but it looks like a real MRI, and it looks like that person has a, a brain tumor. And if you put them side by side with real brain tumor MRIs, you can't tell which one's real and which one is a fake patient. So, and we use that for a bunch of different things. But, but you're right, there is a whole, there's a whole subset where two computers essentially fight with each other and become good at doing these things. So, and then the idea would be that the other computer is trying to figure out if it's okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and the, the, exactly. So the one, as the one becomes good at figuring out the fakes, the one that's generating the fakes has to become better at generating the fakes. Yeah. So, uh, so going, going back to really classical uh, machine learning, uh, so these neural networks uh, have generated a lot of excitement, but these old school machine learning algorithms remain very, very powerful at predicting things. So um, there is, this is a, a decision tree, which all of us are familiar with. Has, it doesn't have to do anything with machine learning, but it, jo it just so happens that there are uh, machine learning algorithms called decision trees. And if you take a bunch of trees and you put them together, then it becomes what's called a random forest. And there's some methods of boosting the performance of that random forest called gradient boosting. And if you have data that lives in a spreadsheet, you know, uh, structured, clean data, these gradient boosting algorithms remain the most powerful way to generate predictions based on that. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, it's important not to get wrapped up in the hype of, of neural networks. All of us want to learn how to use them and are excited about applying them, but it's important also to understand classical machine learning and apply that appropriately too. So, 
A lot of the hype behind this, uh, and the reason it's become so exciting, and the reason that things like GANs exist nowadays, is because of this thing called ImageNet. So ImageNet is a giant repository that has a million pictures, and those pictures have a thousand labels associated with them. And it's the presence of this repository that has allowed us to uh, fine-tune and, and play with these algorithms. So uh, on this slide, you can see uh, people taking the ImageNet challenge, which is basically trying to build an algorithm that's going to predict those labels which we know. And up until 2012, even the best algorithm had a, about a 25% error rate. So they're really pretty terrible. In 2012, the group out of Toronto was the very first to apply a neural network, a convolutional neural network, to this problem. And they dropped, they, they halved the error rate. They went down to 12%. In the subsequent five years, people have added nothing new. They used CNNs, convolutional neural networks, with tweaks and modifications to the algorithm such that in 2018, this, the, the, this, this competition no longer exists because it's considered solved. These algorithms that our, our students, our research fellows, when they join, uh, it, they, you can learn how to program this with about five or six lines of code, and you can solve the ImageNet competition with off-the-shelf algorithms nowadays. So why is that the case? Why is it that it took uh, us getting to 2012 before these things really caught on? Well, there's a few reasons, one of which is hardware. Uh, hardware obviously evolves with us, and it's evolved quite a bit. Uh, in order to build these things and get them to run, we use graphical processing units. So everybody knows about CPUs. Your computer runs on CPUs. But there's a separate part of your computer called a GPU, which was built and designed for teenagers, uh, like I was years and years ago, to play video games. That's the only purpose of these things. That's why they were built. And there's a multi-billion dollar industry around those. One of the companies, uh, called NVIDIA, uh, decided at some point, we're going to unlock our graphical processing units, which are very powerful processors. They're very good at doing things in parallel. And we're going to allow researchers to use them for other things besides computer video gaming. And it was that decision they made in the 1990s that has spawned uh, deep learning. So hardware, both physically and conceptually, has uh, needed to evolve to get us here. Uh, data sets, you know, this is the first time in our history uh, in, as human beings that we're collecting this much data and storing it and curating it. The, our ability to store it has gone up quite a bit. And as I showed you, the algorithms themselves have been uh, tweaked and modified, and now we have robust code and algorithms. But interest in this has also become popular because you know, of the lack of need for feature engineering. And I'll tell you what that is. So. In order for you to build a spreadsheet uh, of, of features of interest, if, for example, if you're looking at a pathology slide and you want to do some research using pathology slides, historically what you've had to do is you've had to take that and look at things like number of cells and the shape of the cells and the nu nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, things that are interesting to you or relevant, and put them into an Excel sheet. And then you take that and you apply some classical machine learning or statistics or whatever the case may be. That's called feature engineering, the process by which you extract features from the thing that you're studying. With deep networks, you don't have to do that. You don't have to sit there and look at a picture of a cat and say, well, it's a cat because it has whiskers and it looks a certain way and it weighs a certain amount. You just give it the raw data and it'll figure out what it needs to do with it. That, that aspect has made it very, very popular. And the last bit is what I alluded to, the fact that you can come into this field as a newcomer without uh, a robust background, and within a reasonably short amount of time, you can learn how to do these things. These things are democratized, whereas that wasn't the case even 10 years ago. To do this 10 years ago, you had to have essentially a degree in computer science, you had to be a programmer, you had to understand the insides and outsides of a GPU. You don't need to know any of that stuff now. Uh, you need a laptop and um, a few hours a week to kill for a few weeks, and you can start to build these things. So let me tell you about how we're applying some of this stuff in neuro-oncology. So uh, probably the most common disease that, that I see in my clinic is this, which is a glioblastoma. It's a very malignant uh, brain tumor, as most people know. Uh, but th the point is, what we call glioblastoma, today I'm convinced we're going to call five different things in a few years, because 
It is not a homogeneous disease. Uh, it's happened with other brain tumors. Um, we have people that survive for years and years and people that die a few months later with the same quote-unquote disease. That's clearly not the case. And one of the differences that we understand reasonably well nowadays is a mutation in this enzyme called IDH. And in this particular case, in this disease, in this enzyme, if you have a mutation, uh, that it's a good thing. You're going to live a whole lot longer. And it's been shown, uh, these are survival curves, on top showing grade fours and on the bottom showing grade threes. But uh, people with grade four tumors live about twice as long on average with this mutation. And grade threes live three and a half times as long. So the point is, it's a, it's a clinically impactful mutation. The, this is the World Health Organization classification of glioblastomas. And nowadays, if you want to call something a GBM, you, you need to know the status of this mutation. Uh, it also happens that it's not incredibly rare. About 1 in 10 patients with grade 4 um, or glioblastoma has this mutation. Today, the only way to know if somebody has it or not is to do this, is to take them to surgery, take a piece of the tumor or, or the whole tumor, and then find out post hoc of the follow-up visit if they have this mutation or not. And then if they have it, you say, well, good news, you have it. But we really wanted to know ahead of time if this person has it or not. Um, because we thought it would make a difference. It would make a difference in the way we converse with our patients. It would make a difference in the way that we plan for surgery, if we even offer surgery. Um, so we thought it would be meaningful to know ahead of time if, if we can, uh, if somebody had this mutation. So we took, in collaboration with our very good friends and colleagues at Martinos at MGH, we took our data from Brigham, we took some publicly available data from TCIA, and we took some data from University of Pennsylvania. And we did something uh, really simple. So again, instead of, instead of go the same algorithm, instead of cats and dogs, you take pictures of GBMs, or DICOMs in this case, and you label them with IDH absent or, or, or present. Now, because brain tumor MRIs are a little bit more complicated than pictures of cats, you have to do some stuff to them to get them to the, a good place where you can run these algorithms, which is all the slide shows. You basically have to take out the noise, things like the skull and the scalp, um, not all MRI machines are made equal, so you have to normalize the differences and so on. But anyway, you still end up with the same fundamental problem. You have a binary classification task for which these networks are really good at. Um, we use different uh, sequences on the MRI. We found that gave us the best, the best possible outcome. And here's our area under the curve. So. Uh, for this particular task, we've shown and we've published that you can achieve a, an accuracy uh, in the 95% range. So you can tell with 95% range accuracy before surgery, just based on a normal structural MRI, whether somebody has this mutation or not, uh, which we think is, is very clinically relevant. Uh, so in this, for this project, we've gone from concept to building a model uh, but I still can't apply it to my patients because it hasn't been prospectively validated, and that's what we're doing today. Uh, I just got some emails about this coming into our clinical space next week, so we're going to prospectively validate this. Uh, the next step is to put it through an FDA approval process and hopefully make this a, a clinically useful tool uh, before the end of the year. Okay, so I've shown you one example of one project that I happen to be especially proud of, I started this project when I was a fellow, uh, which was really only two years ago, so this is the most mature project that we have. But you can easily see, I hope, uh, that this is one, uh, one biomarker. Oh, didn't show up. So this is, this is one biomarker on a list of many, many biomarkers in this one disease process. And there's many similar disease processes. So uh, hopefully you can see how this can go from predicting one mutation to a whole suite where you can predict a lot uh, about a brain tumor from a structural MRI. Hopefully, you can predict as much as you can from a biopsy. And the need to do brain biopsies will go away, and you can do a virtual brain biopsy. And I think that's a, a, a very tenable goal. OK, so as Tim said, I, I uh, have the honor of helping co-direct our, our effort in CNOC and focusing on these projects. And I just want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about the variety of projects that we're dealing with. So. Uh, we're interested in analyzing and understanding natural language because we know that the electronic medical record is mostly natural language. It's mostly unstructured 
data that lives uh, in physicians' notes and radiology reports and so on. And, and we have a few number, a few projects looking at that. Uh, we are doing a lot of projects with projects with neuroimaging, trying to distinguish ambiguous clinical features. In this case, glioblastoma versus lymphoma, which are treated very differently. Uh, some, you know, lymphomas don't need surgery at all and melt away with medical management. And uh, glioblastomas are, are, are a different disease. So. We are using MRIs and pathology slides to help distinguish these clinically ambiguous uh, uh, entities. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects. Uh, Yuki is not here today, but Yuki uh, came to us with no background in computer science or programming or machine learning, any of those things. And uh, towards the end of the time that he was with us, or he is with us, he built this uh, calculator Oh, it works. He built this calculator which uses a gradient boosting algorithm to give you personalized predictions on your survival or your loved one's survival uh, having been diagnosed with glioblastoma. So um, we are very interested in this concept of personalized medicine because it quickly becomes evident that the patient sitting in clinic doesn't care about a population study. Uh, like Omar is saying, it's really, it's really the person sitting across from you so we're interested in giving them predictions relevant to them, and this is one of the first steps towards that. Uh, we also deal with non-malignant brain tumors, because if all you do is brain cancer, you become depressed very quickly. So uh, we do work with segmentation uh, in, in, in the future predictive analytics on, on meningiomas. Um, and we have a whole separate set of projects using uh, neuropathology slides. Uh, this is really fascinating because in the non-neural world, in the chest uh, cancer world, it's been shown that you can take a simple slide like this one. This is an H&E, very boring, simple slide. And you can take an H&E from somebody with lung cancer, and you can predict with high accuracy how long they're going to live for. Uh, because presumably the algorithms are picking up some slight variations in, in tumors that are very aggressive versus ones that are more indolent. And we're replicating some of that in, in brain tumors. And uh, last but not least, we're collecting uh, large amounts of data from the ICU, and um, we have lots of clinical applications for that data. Uh, we've had some technical issues actually getting into that data, but we're all set up to analyze and build, build predictive models using physiology data. We want to predict things like who's going to have a neurological decline before that happens so that we can intervene. We also want to replicate this diabetic retinopathy project in the sense that not every hospital in this country and not every country has a neuro ICU. It's a very specialized part of critical care medicine. So can we translate some of the experts, the, the work that our experts can do here uh, and predict things that for them it's, it's no big deal they can predict? Can we build algorithms that can predict some of those things, same things? And I'll finish by saying that uh, I, I get to be up here to tell you about this research, but. It's really uh, a lot of the folks that are sitting back here are actually doing this work. Um, and uh, we have some really phenomenal collaborations. I feel like we take good advantage of being in Boston because these really smart people live and work here. And, uh, and we, we try to work with as many of them as we can. So we, we love collaborating. And a lot of people are working on this with us. So that's it. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. No, that's a really important point, especially because most of what I talked about is supervised machine learning, so it relies on having these human-generated labels, which if you're going to accept that as the ground truth, it has to actually be the ground truth. So um, my, our solution for this, now that it's not perfect, but our solution for this has been to do a lot of this work in-house if we can. Um, we do a lot of, for the Meningema project, we do, we do segmentation in-house, and the way it's been designed is that there's at least two people doing the segmentation at any given time, independent and blinded of each other. We have these algorithms that 
do this thing called a dice coefficient, which is where you take two 3D structures, overlay them, and see how similar they are. And if they're dissimilar enough, it gets kicked out, and the third person gets brought in. So we spend the majority of the time with these projects is collecting, curating, and making sure the data is good enough. The actual model building is like the fun part that takes a weekend to do. But you spend months and months and months you know, doing that work. So it's, a, it's an important part of it. Yeah, so uh, I should, the better phrase for me to have used instead of natural language is unstructured data because something like 80% of the electronic medical records is unstructured, which refers to the, you know, things that don't live in discrete fields like blood pressure or, or, or temperature. So to your point about quality, I'll, I'll try to address it in, a, in maybe a different way. So one of our first projects was to look at the quality of, of our observers when they try to take this unstructured data and enter it into something that, that we can use, an Excel spreadsheet, okay? So instead of using convolutional neural networks, we use something called recurrent neural networks, which happen to be really good at doing text work, as opposed to these things which are good at looking at images. Anyway, uh, the point is that we asked a team of six Harvard medical students to take unstructured data. In this case, it was radiology reports, and do conceptually a simple task, which is tell me how many METs how many brain mets exist according to this pathology report? And they're all, of course, MRI reports of patients with known brain mets. And, uh, and then we use that, uh, we, we whittled down the ones that were wrong because a, 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 a fourth, third, fourth party did the ground truth labeling. And then we trained uh, an algorithm, an RNN algorithm, to do the same exact task. And of course, it took, you know, it was a thousand reports. It took a few weeks for the medical students to get back to us with their labels. And we measured the error uh, of their labeling versus the error of this recurrent neural network in the labeling. And the error was dramatically lower when the computer did it, when the neural network did it. It also did it in like 0.16 seconds or something, you know, something like that. So, uh, so it doesn't actually answer your question about quality, but it hopefully highlights the fact that you can use it to abstract a lot more data than we currently can from the EMR. Uh, and then you can use that data for all kinds of things, including, I think, like, uh, like you said, quality. Yeah, but even identifying different parameters, parameters that may be yeah. overshadowed by <coughs> the fuzziness of the data right. and outcomes, find the right things to measure that actually relate to quality of clinical care. That, that would be, I think, the goal. I, I, I will tell you that the way that these models are built now, that is their biggest weakness, and it, which is to tell you what it's using to make a prediction. So you can build a model that can be good at predicting you know, quality or whatever the case may be, but it's going to have a hard time, or it's impossible for that model to tell you what it's actually using to get you to that point. So that their biggest weakness is lack of interpretability. Unlike things like logistic regression, where you can get coefficients, 
and you can go back and you can say, oh, this is what's important, and, and it's, you know, it's smoking, I'm going to modify it, you know. But these things will tell you, yeah, this, is, this, this thing is going to kill you, but I'm not going to tell you how it's going to kill you. As a classically trained epidemiologist who's very lazy in my approach to disease and data, I would add that defining what garbage is is very important. Because garbage represents a tremendous amount of information. And if you just take the metaphor of going through someone's garbage, the things they do not want, they throw out that are not important to them, this is how the FBI determines <laughs> the most about you and what you've done that week. So I think I, I am aligning with the conceptually this idea of there has to be a way to rein in variability and spurious information. But it's the garbage, I think, that classical statistics has discarded throughout the ages because of very important uh, theoretical limitations due to the techniques available at the time, the computational power at the time. It's the garbage that we have discarded throughout the history of time. These are the data streams. They're going to end up bringing us the most nuanced information, especially with personalized care. So I, I think that's a really important point. So for our IDH project, <clears throat> we, built the pro we built the model using very clean, very homogeneous Brigham data. And we stripped the skull, and we took out all the noise, and we made it as clean as possible. Then we used, the reason we did, we used Pencil, University of Pennsylvania data is because it came from a separate source, different scanners, uh, different set of patients, and it came with its own set of noise. And that was a prerequisite that we had built into the project, is that we had to get this algorithm to work and validate it on an external noisy data set. Because you're right, if you want to make it applicable and practical, it's got to be able to deal with, to deal with the noise. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point. This is my that's point. The revolution. That, that's the data revolution in my mind. Is that you take rigorous social networking data, like Lamar does, which is clearly establishing a ground truth, which has an unbelievable a priori amount of intellectual property behind it, and establishing sort of our gold standard. But then breakthroughs will occur when it's humanly impossible to account for every other data source. We just don't have the capacity. Whereas a machine who does not fatigue, has no emotional investment, doesn't have plans for the weekend, works through these just mountains of data and finds these associations, which because of our prior knowledge, we are blind to. This, I think, is where we're going to be. So I think it is the garbage that will become not well, that's the whole that's the whole idea of feature extraction. I mean, that's why it's you know instead of taking a, a slide and extracting what you think is relevant, you just give the whole slide and it's raw data. To the, yeah, so that's Back to my original question. Right. I mean, I think I think that supervised learning has to be the foundation, but the future is clearly going to supersede what we are capable of doing as individuals. Right. Um, and so this is why I think. The marriage of these two things and the interface of these two approaches is going to be, uh, it's, it's going to yield uh, unbelievable results. Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess sort of going off Yeah, so you know, the, we talked briefly about the the GANs, the the adversarial networks, and and that's a that's a form of reinforcement learning. It's basically when the model fails and it learns learns from its own from its own failure. So, um, to be honest with you, I don't know that reinforcement learning uh, and unsupervised learning those are the two other kind of big kinds. Uh, they're less commonly used, I think, for a couple of reasons. They're a little bit harder. There's less off-the-shelf product. That do them and so on, but I think you're right. There's there's plenty of room for both those things. 
for using unsupervised learning to find new clusters, new, new associations that we don't know about or think about, uh, and then letting the models fail and letting them improve themselves using reinforcement. So. All right, well, thank you very much.